We take a peek into the restoration of the state capitol and the discussion of a grand energy plan continues. We detail in this week's Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and thank you for tuning in to this week's Capital Report. I'm Julie Barkey. Creating a climate that is conducive to a strong economy and good wages is a priority for most lawmakers. How to achieve it remains a great debate here at the Capitol. The House Select Committee on Living Wage Jobs was created to draft recommendations for creating better jobs and better wages. Tasked with looking back on 30 years of pay equity in Minnesota, this hearing centered on factors that keep businesses in any state. It's not me saying this, it's people who make a living helping companies find the most profitable locations that taxes and tax breaks almost never matter because they're too small a cost factor in companies' decision-making process. The business basics labor, occupancy, proximity to customers, proximity to suppliers, uh, other key inputs depending on whatever the company makes or does are the things that really drive how companies decide where to expand or relocate. Joining me right now is the chair of that committee, Representative Ryan Winkler, to talk a little bit about what they've done thus far. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So, Representative, let's talk about the meetings that you've had so far. What have you been taking from them? Well, the big thing we've been trying to do is understand the state of the economy for the average worker in Minnesota. Uh, for a long time, we've had a model in this state of a strong, healthy economy where the benefits of that economic growth are spread out to a lot of people. So you could have a good job, raise a family, have a good quality of life in this state without having uh, to be the head of a company or without being a high-wage, high-level professional. You could uh, live your life and get by and have a pretty good life in Minnesota. Um, and that has started to erode pretty significantly in this state, uh, much like the rest of the country. We used to be a leader in uh, median wage, for example, and that's been falling. Uh, we had very low rates of poverty, and compared to the rest of the country, we still do, but that's been going up. And the kind of jobs that we're creating in this economy are low-wage jobs that focus in the retail, food service, temp worker and the low end of the healthcare sector. So we've got some big challenges and a lot of what we've done so far this session or last session as we were gathering information is just to understand the state of the economy today for those workers. In the meeting that you held um, the end of June, something really drew my attention, and that was coming from Greg Leroy from Good Jobs First, which is a national nonpartisan organization. And he stated that studies show that state tax breaks are not a driving factor where business uh, for businesses who plan to expand or relocate. And yet the tax bill that was just passed really goes in that direction. When you look at the tax breaks for Mayo, Mall of America, 3M, there are billions included in this. So you're not the chair of the tax committee. So understanding that, but as chair of this committee, how do you move forward with that knowledge? Well, we know that, that uh, politicians like to pass bills that create jobs. And generally the way they do, do that is through subsidies or through tax breaks. Most of those things don't work because at the state level, we have to balance the budget. So in order to provide one tax benefit to one company, we have to tax another company, another person, or we have to cut some service or some benefit somewhere. It's a net uh, zero uh, for any particular kind of job subsidy. But what we were trying to do is say, looking at the reality that, we are, that people do this, that this is a political reality, that people want to pass these types of things, what are the best kinds of incentives we can do? What are the things that actually create jobs and not uh, kind of be uh, the worst uh, to kind of work at cross purposes for other things we're trying to do. So uh, we can't kind of change that whole political world, but we can hopefully do a little bit better job uh, and focus on things that will work best. Something else that he stated was that quality workforce and proximity to customers and vendors are significant reasons to stay put or to relocate here or somewhere else. And the legislature did identify that workforce development is key and increased funding in that capacity. Do you think it's enough? I think that making workers more productive helps bring in capital, helps bring in companies who want to locate here. That is part of the equation. But in Minnesota, workers are more skilled, more productive, more educated than they have been in the past. And yet, if you look at the wages that they're receiving for that work, it's, it's still declining compared to the economy as a whole. So it's not enough just to have an educated workforce that will draw in companies. You have to have an economy where the average person can actually support themselves and their family and hopefully provide a little bit of life for their children ahead. And if you don't do that, I don't think we're doing enough. And that's a perfect segue to this next question, which has to do with increasing the state's minimum wage, something you fought valiantly for last session, likely to come up again next session. 
what do you think a living wage job is and a livable wage job is in relation to um, to minimum wage? Yeah, I mean, we should not be confused to think that a minimum wage is the same as a living wage. In Minnesota, statewide average, a bare bones budget, which means you just pay for housing, transportation, child care, health care, food, no vacations, no savings, nothing like that. A bare bones budget statewide for a family of four takes two jobs at $14 an hour. So that's significantly above the minimum wage that we proposed in the House th uh, this last session of $9.50 an hour. But one of the things that happens when you raise the minimum wage is that you do put upward pressure on all wages at the lower end of the economy. So that will help move more people into a better wage job. And we recognize that moving right to a $14 an hour minimum wage would be really outside of the mainstream in this country and historically uh, to some degree. But I think that uh, over time we need to continue to move up the minimum, the minimum wage to make sure that the buying power of the average worker keeps up with the economy. And the GOP, including Senator Julie Rosen, who we spoke to about this issue, they contend and they they contend to this day that it would kill small businesses you know, by increasing the state's yeah. minimum wage. And you have obviously disagreed with that statement. That's the same argument opponents of the minimum wage have used since 1938 when FDR first signed a minimum wage into law. The same argument was used in the, 18, uh, the 1980s, the 1990s in Minnesota, when the federal minimum wages increased. There's just no evidence, there's no reality that raising the minimum wage costs jobs. And one of the reasons is that when workers make a little bit more money, they tend to stay in those jobs longer. There's less turnover. And by decreasing turnover, you actually reduce business cost. Now, it's not the kind of thing that's easy for a business to predict. They just see a cost increase. But the combination of lower turnover and greater demand, because more money is in workers' pockets to spend, actually nets out the, the change in the minimum wage. But why not just let the market drive the wages? If you have a good employee, you're going to compensate him or her accordingly. Well, the challenge is that the market is driving wages down, and as uh, the labor market is driving wages down for a variety of reasons, I think, uh, the average consumer doesn't have the money in their pocket to go out and buy the things a business needs. So you're, you're focusing entirely on the supply side of the economy, the business side of the economy, and not on the consumer side. And if consumers can't buy, there is nothing going on in this economy. And how does this marry in with the recommendations that you hope to make down the road from, from the select committee? Well, obviously, these issues are they're uh, economy-wide, they're nationwide issues. In fact, they're global issues in a lot of ways. Um, so the state of Minnesota in the 2014 legislative session is not going to uh, completely turn this around. But some of the things that I think are going to be important will be a minimum wage. It will be looking at uh, uh, wage and benefit standards for employees, uh, for example, paid sick leaves. Uh, some states have pursued a, a paid time off insurance program, which is for you know pennies a week you can actually give people a chance to take care of sick relatives and friends. That's a huge issue for women and for low-wage workers. So there's a whole range of things that we're going to be proposing. I think uh, it, it will probably be too much for the 2014 legislature to take them all up, but I hope we can make some progress. And my last question for you, the committee is about to embark on listening tours, listening sessions across the state. Any expectations as you head out? Um, head out and listen to folks. Well, our, we're going to go out with one simple question, and that is, how is Minnesota's economy working for you? And we want to hear from people. Uh, I hear anecdotally from people who say, look, I've got a graduate degree, I've got a professional degree, and I'm stuck at 20 bucks an hour. I should be able to, you know, with a graduate degree and a decent job, I should be able to save for my retirement and for my kids' education, and that's just, those are luxuries I can't afford. So I think we're going to be hearing a lot from people, not just uh, restaurant workers, but from people all over the economy who are saying that my earnings are simply not keeping up with the cost of living and we need to do something else. Okay, Representative Winkler, we hope to get you in when you complete these tours. Thanks for coming in. We appreciate your time. Thank you very much. A staunch opponent to raising the minimum wage is Senator Julie Rosen. We sat down with her earlier to find out why she believes wages should be market driven. Do you think that it is necessary to tell employers what they need to pay, pay, pay their employees? Absolutely not, Julie. I think, again, we're being very punitive to the small business employer and it seems like it is just a session of shame on you for being for taking the risk of being a small business owner and investing in in this great state so um, it's obviously difficult for these employers to find good 
employees out there. And once they find a good employee, they're going to compensate them appropriately. And when you start adding on all this, all this stuff that we, we've got on the agenda this year, and starting off with was the uh, health insurance exchange. That's going to be a cost driver for the small business owner. And then you go to the tax bill, and then you go to now the, the newly um, passed out of tax committee transportation bill with the wholesale tax and the wheelage tax, and you've got a water tax, and you've got um, an energy, higher energy cost, all coming down and filtering back on to the small business owner. And frankly, many of them are throwing up their hands and saying, how can I continue on? How can I provide these jobs? This is their life and soul. They've taken this risk. Let's give them a break. Let's, let's let them do their job. And yet the argument has been, particularly for unskilled labor in certain areas, you know, fast food is one example, that if you didn't have a, a minimum wage with a livable wage, people wouldn't work there at all. So from that standpoint, do you think it helps move the economy to you know, help drive the economy a bit to provide well, it, it, some of the, it, if it's a fast food or some in, in that market, I think that's a little bit different than some of the other industries. And as far as a livable wage, we, there is a lot of stopgap for people that <clears throat> have to need, need help assistance, Minnesota Care, you know, there's a lot of assistant programs out there. Um, so we can fill in the gap there. I'm worried about what this is going to do to the ag community. And you start thinking about that, and you start thinking about areas where they don't have the pool of um, workers and resources out there. And all of a sudden, um, like I said, when, when they get some good employees, and they're going to pay them appropriately. And I think we should respect the small business owner to take care of their business. And they put a tremendous amount of investment and time into these employees. They're going to pay them what they have to to keep them. Right. Senator Julie Rosen, with those words, thank, thank you. you for your time. Thank you, Julie. Governor Mark Dayton met with the Capital Preservation Committee to get an update on the four-year, $240 million project. Much of the work this summer focuses on cleaning and repairing the exterior stonework. And as crews continue with the project, the future is a bit murky. The governor says self-interest will have to be pushed aside by himself, lawmakers, and tenants of the building if the restoration is to do what it's intended to do, restore the building while making it functional for the next 100 years. That's going to be miserable for you, for me, for everybody who needs to function. Here. It's going to be like a major highway project. You know, you've got to go through that disruption and dislocation and everything else in order to get to the other side, which is which is essential for the health and safety of the people who work here as well as the general public who comes to visit here. So I don't think we have any option. We need to explain to Minnesotans why this is an imperative, why it's something we can't postpone any longer and we'll make the best of the situation. But Minnesota is on track to exceed the national standards when it comes to reducing carbon emissions and increasing renewable energy production. Joining me right now is the chair of the Senate Environment and Energy Committee, John Marty, to talk a little bit about what this message means to Minnesotans. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Let's begin with that question, Senator. What do you think it means that Minnesota is leading the pack? It's a good news for our jobs and businesses. Um, it's good news for the environment. We have a long way to go. We're just beginning the step forward in a new energy economy. And um, I think we can learn from other countries. Germany is moving forward aggressively. They've created more jobs than anybody else on the planet in this area. What's, do you think any of this would have even happened without legislative direction and intervention? Uh, energy change, there, there are plenty of businesses. You talk to Bloomberg, financial folks, they'll say investments in renewable energy is strong right now. People are doing it because they see a good future there. Um, it happens a lot faster, a lot stronger, a lot better if we put some state effort to make this happen. That's why we're trying to do it. We like Minnesota solar companies, Minnesota wind companies, Minnesota conservation businesses. We'd like to see them grow so Minnesota gets the jobs rather than import them from other states. And Senator, we did talk to you about that near the end of session, a little bit about the money that's being allocated to solar. So now comes the implementation part of that. Where, where does the commission stand and the committee stand on trying to get more solar manufacturing jobs, people into solar? 
just this week, I actually spoke to Minnesota Solar Energy Association, which is businesses. There were 100 people there. Um, they were small electrical businesses, small solar businesses, and so on. Um, they're talking about how many businesses they've had express interest in moving manufacturing plants into Minnesota because of what we've done. Uh, we'll wait and see. I don't want to predict that, oh, we've got all these jobs because this bill passed, but there's real interest. They're the ones who implement what we've done. We set out some policies that we hope will inspire the industry to grow, help them grow, and we think it's going to happen. Nationally speaking, President Obama wants to also increase natural gas production while moving away from coal. By some, this is being dubbed a war on coal. Would you say would you say that it's a war, and is, it, is that a fair assessment? Well, I think the thing we have to look at, in politics, you know, we often look at two years or four years. The next election is long-term thinking. You know, I, I think we ought to be thinking long-term thinking is my great-grandkids or their great-grandkids, because this is their planet, this is their state, too. We don't know who they are yet, but we've got to be thinking about that. And, you know, if coal emissions are going to destroy the climate that they have to live in, Maybe it's time to be declaring war on something that's going to kill off our great grandkids. But the argument is that technologies can reduce those carbon emissions, so coal could still be viable. They can reduce some of it. They're not going to. The bottom line is coal is probably one of the worst factors. Oil, even natural gas, is not a step forward. What we basically have is a problem is that for 650 million years, energy storage has been compressed into what becomes fossil fuels. That's why they're called fossil fuels. And that's stored energy from the sun and plant life and animal life that decays and eventually works down to this over millennia and um, over eons. And we're trying to, as human races in three, four hundred years of time, trying to burn up hundreds of millions of years worth of energy storage and that's just he superheating up the climate. So we have to change that. And we don't have a lot of time in terms of human history. We don't have a lot of time to change it for the sake of our great grandkids. And Senator, you've been very vocal about wanting to make Minnesota the first state in the nation to be 100% fossil fuel free. How viable of a goal is that given this political climate, the environmental climate? Do you think it's possible? It's not going to happen next year. It's not going to happen this decade. Um, whether it happens in 20 years or 60 years, it's going to happen somewhere in that range, I think. And we can't, we don't know the technologies yet. Technologies, every week you hear new technologies developing and more efficient ways of doing things. And bottom line is, it's time for us to start taking a look at the long term, not just the next two or four or six or eight years, but the next two or four or six or eight generations. We ought to be looking at that. And I think that's our obligation to the future. And I think we're doing that. That's what I'm excited about. We're bringing together all the stakeholders, not just the environmental advocates, but the utilities, the businesses and labor and everybody. Bring them together and start figuring out how we make this transition, which we have to do. And how, what are you hearing from business owners, particularly utilities, who some are phasing out coal, some are not? Are they ready? I think that they're ready with some push and some encouragement. Um, what I've been doing when I meet and talk with the utilities, which I do regularly as chair of the committee, um, when I talk with them, I tell them, we're going to have to push you more than you feel comfortable. These are very cautious, conservative businesses, appropriately so. And we're going to push them more than they feel comfortable. But we also understand they're the ones who deliver the power. And we want to make sure that they can be very profitable and very successful delivering clean power to people. We spoke with Senator Dave Brown, the lead Republican on your committee, and he stated essentially he thinks government needs to, step, needs to take a step back on this issue and just let the standards that are currently in place be in place for a while and see how that works. You just mentioned a little bit of a legislative push and encouragement. Where's the balance? Is there one? The balance is that we've got in terms of the main greenhouse gas that's heating up the climate, we've got 400 parts per million right now. That's the highest in 2.6 million years. It's growing by about two points a year. We can't continue that trend. We have to reverse that trend in saying, well, we're not in any hurry. The way I would phrase it, and Senator Brown obviously would disagree, but we'll see how this plays out in the next couple of decades, and that is no matter how bold we are now, and I don't think we're being as bold as we need to be, no matter how bold we are now, I think 20 years from now, people are going to look back and ask why we were so timid. And 
Senator Brown may not see it yet, but we had testimony this year, beginning of the session, from the Insurance Federation, not a radical group, the insurance businesses in Minnesota, talking how their premiums for homeowners have more than doubled in a decade because of more severe weather patterns, more tornadoes, more high wind storms, more flooding, more the things that are associated with higher global temperatures. Not not heat waves only, but heat and drought and flooding and all those severe storms. That's causing homeowner premiums to double in a decade. They're not bragging about it. They're just alerting us. And he may not see that, but I think the public is beginning to catch on. So what's next for you next session? It's a policy year. We're, right now, I'd say what we're focusing on right now is getting the Energy Commission, that's 20 legislators, bipartisan group, get them to start bringing together everyone, all the stakeholders. So we don't have the fights at the Capitol here, but so we bring people together, educate each other, work with each other, figure out how Minnesota can create an economy that's clean energy, and it's going to do huge things for numbers of jobs and our businesses. That's what we ought to be doing for this state. It's good for the environment and it's great for the economy. All right, Senator John Marty, as always, thank you for coming in and talking with us. We appreciate your time. My pleasure. Lead Republican on the Senate Environment and Energy Committee, Senator David Brown joins me now to talk about his perspective on where Minnesota stands with energy production. Thanks for joining us today. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Julie. Thank you for having me. Senator, let's begin with what you think the message is with the, regarding the fact that Minnesota is actually on track to exceed the national standards when it comes to reducing carbon emissions and increasing renewable energy production. What does it mean to Minnesotans? Well, uh, it means a few different things. Um, potentially, it, it the long road could mean higher energy prices for us when we get our monthly bills. But we are on track to, re, uh, to reach the renewable standards. I hated to see us propose uh, increasing those standards pretty significantly over that five-year period from 2025 to 2030 um, because we are on track and I think we need to focus on that. It's only been in effect since I think 2007. So I think we need to focus on what we've set in place already before we steadily increase those standards. Um, but uh, over the last two decades across the nation, uh, carbon emissions have fallen, have been at their lowest level since uh, two decades ago. So I think those are good things. Um, I think a lot of what's being proposed maybe is going overboard and it's going to drastically increase the cost of energy. And President Obama wants to increase natural gas mm -hmm. production and move away from coal. This is being dubbed by many as a war on coal. Where do you think coal fits on this energy landscape? I think coal is still going to be our most cost-effective option, and I think we should use it as an option. Uh, I live in Becker, where Minnesota's largest coal uh, circle, largest coal uh, energy producing plant is, and uh, people uh, decry the amount of uh, pollution they say is taking place. Um, I don't agree with that. Yes, there is some, but they have very stringent standards on the mercury being released and the emissions being released from Sherco, as do most coal producing plants. And I still think it's our most cost effective option. There are some environmental concerns that are rising about water quality issues if there's drilling through shale to get to natural gas. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, the the move is to go more towards natural gas as opposed to coal. So is it possible, in your opinion, to preserve the environment while tapping into this resource, if indeed this is the direction the nation and the state go? Well, my concern with natural gas is that very thing of, of fracking. We're seeing the price fall significantly because of the abundance of supply with fracking. But there are many, especially in the environmentalist group, who want to put an end to fracking. If that were to happen and we convert these coal plants to natural gas, we most definitely will see our electric bills rise because the cost of natural gas would explode if uh, we put it into fracking. I don't know what direction fracking is going to go in the state. So, Senator, there is a move at the state level for sure and definitely the national level to move to renewable energy and away from fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. Do you think this is viable at all? Well, what I found interesting, you'd mentioned President Obama's uh, speech. When he was in Africa, he was promoting the use of fossil fuels in Africa. They have newfound oil and gas reserves in Af Africa, and he was speaking very positively of that. But yet here in America, it's like he wants us to move away from those sources. Those really are, fossil fuels are our um, main source of electric energy if we want reliable 24 hours, seven days a week energy. 
Now, if we want to move more towards renewable, are we willing to give up our 24-7 use of electricity? Are we, are we willing to have intermittent electric uh, energy uh, delivery to us? I don't think we are. Well, and Senator Marty aspires to Minnesota becoming the first state in the nation to be 100% fossil fuel free. Why not move in this direction if renewables, if there are all of these other resources and sources that can be tapped into? There are sources that can be tapped into, and we are tapping into them, but solar and wind are not yet base load uh, producers of energy. They're very intermittent. They are being used. Excel is using uh, uh, wind very well, uh, but they're not yet base load uh, capable of providing energy 24 hours, seven days a week. That's why we need coal. That's why we need nuclear. You talked a little bit earlier about solar and the state did take significant steps to increase solar production and manufacturing in the state of Minnesota. How challenging do you think it's going to be to try to implement a lot of what was passed last session? Uh, I guess we have yet to see. I think it's going to be very challenging. Um, it's being subsidized. Um, solar may someday be uh, a very effective uh, source of energy production for us. Right now it's not. It's not at that place yet. And I think we're trying to force it. And they think by forcing it, we will force us to get there. Um, I just think it's several years away yet. So if you could craft an energy plan that you think would work for Minnesota, mm -hmm. what would it look like? What would Our it main sources would be uh, what they are now, coal and nuclear. And I would lift the moratoriums on those. I would stop uh, putting excise tax on the coal that comes into the state so it would be even cheaper than what it is now. Um, I just, I, I have a hard time, th this whole argument is based around the idea that carbon emissions is causing man-made climate change. I disagree with that. Yes, we're seeing our climate change. I disagree that it's man-made, and I disagree that uh, carbon emissions is the cause of it. As I said a little bit ago, uh, carbon emissions are at the lowest level in two decades. So uh, if, if that's the case, we can't attribute the flood in Duluth that some have to man-made climate change. We can't attribute the flooding in southern Minnesota. There's no scientific evidence that that's the cause of these events, but yet it very quickly gets thrown out as the cause. And the committee is continuing to have hearings throughout the interim, as many committees do. committee meetings um, do occur here at the Capitol. So what do you expect to hear, and what are some of the policies that you intend to have a hand in as we get closer to next session? Well, if I have a hand in something, it will be less government restriction um, like I said, I still believe coal and nuclear are our best options. I believe the Legislative Energy Commission is going to, well, the whole idea of why they wanted to hire an executive director is get us to comply with this thinking that we need more renewable, we need to meet these standards quicker, we need to be the first state in the nation with 100% renewables. I disagree with that, um, but that's the direction this commission is going to go. Okay, Senator Brown, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you. your time. Thanks. It's now easier to stay in touch with activity at the state capitol. Senate Media Services is on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Find the links on our homepage. So follow us and follow the Senate. That concludes this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching Capitol Report.